Hello. Welcome to a new vlog. It's Sunday, the 29th of August <clears throat> at 1 in the afternoon. If you watched my last video, which was a book haul, I'll put it somewhere up here if you want to watch. I mentioned that we had just gotten back from traveling, so we're in isolation for... It's supposed to be for two weeks, but there's an option to take um, a test in the middle of it to shorten the isolation. So um, I thought that it would be a good time to do a vlog. So I am reading um, The End of Eddie by Edouard Louis. Edouard Louis is um, a French author. He's very young. He's 29 years old. Um, and he's a queer author. This is his first piece of fiction, which is autofiction, definitely about his own life. I read the back of this in my last video, um, but for those of you that are new to this video um, and hearing about it for the first time, I'll read it to you. Edouard Louis grew up in a village in northern France where many live below the poverty line. His best-selling debut novel about life there, The End of Eddie, has sparked debate on social inequality, sexuality, and violence. It is an extraordinary portrait of escaping from an unbearable childhood inspired by the author's own. Written with an openness and compassionate intelligence, ultimately it asks, how can we create our own freedom? I'm 100 pages in. It's a little under 200 pages, so I'm about halfway. I'm 20 pages from part two. Um, the first part is called Picardy, which I think is an area of France late 1990s to the early 2000s, and then part two is failure in flight, so I'm almost to part two. This is definitely examining um, Louise's upbringing, childhood, being in a poverty-stricken area of France. A lot to do with toxic masculinity, especially in his family, but also just in the environment that he grows up in, in the local society, and what he feels being a young gay boy in that kind of environment, the violence that he is unfortunately subject to, just a bad home life, a bad school life. Um, it's quite depressing, and I think it's a heavy one. Um, the interesting thing is, in the very beginning, as I started reading, you know, he's sparing no details when it comes to disgusting, grotesque, violent things and situations. Um, and it kind of is hitting you like on every other page, there's something like really hard to read. Um, and in the beginning that really was like, wow, it was, you know, taking something from my guts. And sometimes I was on the tram, had to like put it down for a second to look out the window. It keeps, you know, adding more and more and more and more shitty things. Um, and I start to not really feel so connected to them. I'm just kind of reading them and they're, they're less affecting me, um, which maybe I find a bit, um, I don't know what I feel, but I just think, um, Certainly his uh, writing and voice is captivating, and, and when I first met his voice at the beginning of the book, I was really drawn in. I think it dipped a little bit in how much I felt connected to him or connected to the events. I feel a little bit disassociated. One of the last um, chapters that I read is called A Good Education, um, and that was really hard. I'm just going to read this passage for you. There were other occasions, of course, when I was grateful for my mother's lack of attention. When I would arrive home from school, she could have seen how drawn my face was, as if I had wrinkles. If my face seemed wrinkled, it was because the beatings aged me. I was only 11, but already I was older than my mother. So there's some really um, heart-wrenching, harrowing, but beautiful sentences in here. And this particular chapter um, definitely did hit me. So, yeah. Uh, nice to read from a gay author. I do, as someone who, you know, of course, had a hard time on a, some level when I was young, um, just being different than everybody else. So it's a little bit triggering, although I did not have this experience, but it does trigger me um, 
a little bit to read that about a young person. It's just horrible. So I'm feeling that he's very brave writing this um, and very vulnerable. It's sort of jumping around reflections on different people in his family, his relationship with his father or lack of relationship with his father, mother, siblings, school life. I'm gonna go read a little bit and I'll be back. Hello, I've made my um, way to part two. Last section of part one was a longer chapter called Sylvain, an eyewitness account. Um, and it's sort of his grandmother retelling the story of Sylvain, which is his cousin. Basically just a very sad story of his um, delinquent behavior, um, alcoholism, which eventually ended him up in jail, and then he got out for like a family visit, so he spent some time with his family and his wife and his kids, and then he was drunk driving and got pulled over by the police and basically escaped until they found him again and put him back in jail. So it's another chapter that's kind of just like a really, really unfortunate story of a person, but what I do feel like in this particular chapter is that Louis is trying, is making a comment on the class system. The judge says, can you affirm that your acts are imputable to external influences of some kind, or is it your feeling that you were in full control of yourself during this incident? My cousin stammered that he hadn't understood the question and he asked for it to be repeated. He wasn't embarrassed, he didn't feel the violence the prosecutor was exercising. The class violence that had excluded him from the world of education. The violence that had, in the end, led him to the courtroom where he now stood. He just uses this term, class violence, which I think definitely is something that he's starting to explore in this book. The fact that there is social inequality and class inequality and class injustice, if I can say that, um, is violent, violent to a person who it excludes. Um, so I think that that's a really interesting way to put it. I do have a thought that I wish a little bit like we would get more of Eddie's feelings or he's describing a lot of really horrible things that are done to him, done to people around him or committed by people around him and you don't get so much about how it makes him feel. I mean, you do get it a little bit, but I'm wishing that there was more. Maybe it will come. Okay, hello. Hello. So I've gotten to um, the chapter which is called The Shed, which if you've read this, um, you probably know what's happening there. Whoa, gotta take a break. I gotta mm, just set that down for a second. We decided to make some curry um, with chickpeas. So I'm just preparing the curry sauce, which I thought that I could just share with you. Is it okay that you're in the background? How do you do that? I've tried my whole life and I cannot do that. You put oil in the bottom of the pan and then you take some garlic and you just throw it in. Usually we use ginger, but we don't have ginger and obviously we can't leave the house to get groceries and our food delivery, like ingredients delivery has not um, arrived yet. But today it's just garlic and you cook that until it's like a little bit brown and then you spice it. So you kind of make almost like a curry paste at the bottom so the oil mixes with like usually the main ingredient is turmeric um, but I think today we'll add some other things I'm gonna let the spice queen over here um, do that and then you cut you dice tomatoes and throw it in and then you cook 
the juice out of the tomatoes and then coconut milk and then there you have your curry sauce oh you also put like a bay leaf in there if you have one and you can like spice a little bit more mostly you just need salt after you put the coconut milk because it'll get quite sweet and we always add some citrus either lemon or lime but that's towards the end making a beautiful sizzling sound. <laughs> <laughs> And drops the camera into the pot. Don't even try. Cooking is so exhausting. Dad? Mm -hmm. Now? Yes. Is now the time? Yes. Please. Mmm. It's like one of those hypnotizing cooking videos. Beautiful. So I'm about 150 pages in. The next um, chapter I'm reading is called The Body's Rebellion. So the section now, like part two, I don't know why I'm doing this. It's more of an exploration of Eddie's sexuality in relationship to sex itself and desire. Also just an emphasis on, also like through this whole book, I feel like, how you're perceived by others, especially when it comes to gender identity, what it's expected of you um, when you're a man, what people would see or label you as if they looked at you. And it would, there was just this one sentence that said, um, it's like without context, it says, but the crime was not having done something, it was being something, and especially looking like one of them, looking like a gay person. Um, and yeah, that there's like this emphasis on not even actions, but being that thing, looking that thing, looking queer, that that's really what you're judged on. It's hard to just follow this character and see him just trying so, so hard with activities and ways of speaking and ways of changing the body movement and you know, trying to display affection for girls in a public way, just all to kind of like convince everyone and also convince himself that he's, you know, straight and just not who he really is. So it's just sad to watch him in this um, situation. So I'm probably gonna go finish this. Lunch was delicious. Um, and Ohad's watching a movie. He's watching Evita. I'll come back to give you my final thoughts on it. I'm actually um, sitting with the like nightlight that I have. Not nightlight. What am I? Like three years old? Bedside table little lamp that I have next to my bed for reading um, is like the perfect spotlight for when I need to film in the evening when it's dark. So I finished the end of Eddie. There's an epilogue in the end for, I don't know, six or seven pages. Um, and I would say that that is like, sort of, um, yeah, our, oh, it's hard to not spoil it, but it's like an important um, moment in this character's life. Definitely takes a more positive note. Um, so that was really nice. I was uh, chatting a little bit with Alex from What Page Are You On? Um, about this book on Instagram today. And he was saying, he was just mentioning that there's a lot about this book that's like really deeply rooted in French classism. So we're missing a bit of context here when it comes to how much he's referring to class inequality in his environment. This is a really um, brave book, a really important book. I think, you know, his exploration of poverty, sexuality, I think that those are really, really important things and I feel that he's very blunt and at times very raw about the details of that life. I do feel at some points the kind of structure of the book lost me. I question sometimes 
um, how the book is structured as a whole. I don't know if it, I think it maybe could have been stronger somehow. So yeah, I finished that. Yes, bitch. It's Monday. Uh, we're almost at the end of August, which I just realized today. Time flies. I feel weird about my daily vlogging because normally my favorite thing to do is to film making coffee in the morning, but my camera was dead. The battery was exhausted, so that didn't happen. So last night I started to film a clip of the book that I started um, after the end of Eddie which is Strange Hotel by Amar McBride, but I just could not get my words out last night. I was just like trying to explain what I thought and it just was not going well and for me. I did not feel like I was being clear, so I feel like I'm gonna retry that now. So I will read you the back of Strange Hotel. A woman enters an Avignon hotel room. She's been here once before, but while the room hasn't changed, she's a different person now. Forever caught between check-in and check-out, she will go on to occupy other hotel rooms from Prague to Oslo, Auckland to Austin, each as anonymous as the last. There, amid the open suitcases, the matchbooks, cigarettes, keys, and room service wine, she will negotiate with memory, with the men she sometimes meets, and with what it might mean to return home. Mer McBride won the Women's Prize for Fiction with a novel called A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, which I am not familiar with. So I wrote some notes um, about my reading so far of this. So I think the book is broken up into different hotel rooms. Um, so I read until the end of the first one, I think, inside a hotel room in Avignon in France. So I'm on page 33. Initial thoughts about this, I find her writing style really, really, really difficult. It's sort of jarring when you read some read two different books back to back because there's a period of time where you're like adjusting to the new voice the new style the new structure and it can be kind of like whoa 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 it can take you a second my initial thought was oh my god i have to read the first page five times and i'm still not particularly sure that i know exactly what she's talking about this is from The Guardian. It says, Reading Strange Hotel is a matter of strange immersion and one that will often puzzle and sometimes frustrate the reader. But its portrait of sadness and alienation is, in the end, also strangely revivifying. So, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if it's just that, if it's like a frustration um, with being kind of puzzled by the style. But I think it's all connected to the fact that this is definitely about the interior, interior, <laughs> girl, interior world um, of a woman. So we are inside her thoughts. She has got conflicting voices in her head. She's very critical also about her own thoughts. We're peeking in on her aloneness inside a hotel room and everywhere that her head and thoughts are flying around. So that would be kind of confusing and could be a bit puzzling. So I think that I, like as I kept reading until the end of that first section, I started to sort of <clears throat> understand that there may be some strange and puzzling um, sentences that are or like very very fragmented that I can't exactly put together but also that is in some ways the way that our mind works this Avignon hotel and hotel room is a hotel room that she's been to before um, so we get this conflict between her memory of the place and her th thoughts about the place in the present and she is I don't know exactly what, but she had some kind of, I think a one night stand or some kind of sexual encounter, that's what I'm feeling, with a man in this hotel room one night a few years ago, and now she's back in this hotel room. She wouldn't love to be there, but she ends up there. She finds a lot of things about the hotel not so nice, and she's at war in her thoughts with trying to be there fresh and not be there 
existing in the memories of the last time that she was there. And on one of the pages, this is page eight, if you're, if you're reading along, she writes, she remembers that, thinking that. So now does she think it afresh? And can she think it afresh or only ever again? So yeah, that kind of feeling when you're in a place for the, for the second time, for example, and it's linked to a lot of memories or first impressions that you had of that place the first time. And like, could you ever think something completely fresh inside the same space? Or will you always just be piecing together things from your memory? And can anything be fresh if you've already encountered it? So that I just think is really interesting. And she's obviously dealing with that because of my job. Well, not in like a COVID world, but because of our job, you know, we travel, we travel a lot, um, performing in different places. So there are chunks of time when we're existing in hotel rooms, one after the other after the other, and they all kind of blend together. And so I can relate to the feeling of like getting into a hotel room, putting your stuff down. Like, do I hang my stuff? Probably not because I won't be here long enough. And there's like certain things about her experience that I can find really relatable and is fun to read since I haven't really had that experience for a while. Like she is building the atmosphere in a really interesting way. And she'll talk about like the sweat on the back of her neck and the ceiling fan is like whirring and there's like a humidity and like these palm leaves that are painted in like a really weird way inside the lobby. So there's um, this sense of like almost claustrophobia, which I can really like. And the pace of the book is weird. It's fragmented. Sometimes it's a really, 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 really long sentence and then it gets finally to an end and you're like, okay, that's what she meant. Or like she gets to a clear thought, but on the way it went a few different places. Door, scratched, dull, lock, put in, turn the key, fail, joggle, lean into, be firm, try again now, try again, again, and on another try, there, she's in. She shuts it hard behind, abominable heat. The day aches around her shoulders in search of other mischief. Headache as she turns the anxious air conditioning on. There is also this fragmented sense of action. I'm doing, I'm thinking, I'm going inside. Oh, there's heat. It feels, my shoulders hurt. Like, this is the kind of um, pace. I wrote that I recommend this book for a person who enjoys eavesdropping because there's a whole section when she wakes up in the morning and she just hears the man next door and she's describing everything he's doing. Okay, I can hear that he walked to the shower, he opened a shower curtain, makes a certain kind of noise so it's on a metal rod and I can probably even tell you what brand of shower curtain that is. And then he boils a kettle, I wonder if it's for tea or for coffee. So if you like a kind of observational book and especially a listening through a you know paper thin wall, um, nosy eavesdropping vibes um then that's this uh, you probably might really you would probably like that like this the other thing i wanted to say and i put um, a video on instagram about it um but i'll i guess uh re say it here also that i wanted to make a video that's kind of like what to read if i'm feeling dot 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 so a sort of mood recommendation um for reading a video it'd be fun to collect them from you and then pick a few and make a video and if we get a lot we could maybe make it a series i've been having a lot of fun getting back into reading after being on vacation i always feel like vacation reading is really difficult for me um but in isolation at home is the perfect chance to dive back in i also feel like i'm a little bit out of practice about talking about books so i hope that i'm um, doing a somewhat decent job. Also, can I show them your book? Um, I just wanted to share with all of my Rooney fans that Ohad is reading Conversations with Friends, the Hebrew version, so I'm really interested to know what, um, how Sally Rooney will go.
Hello, I'm back after reading um, about half of the book. Also, I just watched Rebecca's um, latest vlog from Rebecca Eats Books, and I was like, God damn it, she's just so good at talking about books. She's so just, mm. I need to get my shit together and be better. It's really like teetering this line between this is not working for me, like the structure is too difficult for me to keep up with, and then on the other hand, feeling like this is brilliant. This is really, really brilliant. So <laughs> I, I think I'm feeling like it's really brilliant. It doesn't mean that it's flawless. I think it's more like extremely interesting, creative, and brilliant than it is um, flawed. Thank you. Thank you. What's interesting is that everything is happening in this woman's head. However, it's not told from first person. So we get the, she does this, she thinks, she goes out. Um, but then everything that's written there is so internal that the only person that would be privy to those thoughts are the woman herself. So I just think that it's interesting that Emer McBride did not write this from a first person. And I, I think it's like a very interesting choice because it feels also like we're looking in from the outside on this woman, however, we know everything that's happening in her head. Second kind of chapter of this Prague hotel room basically all happens on the balcony of this hotel room. She has just had like a one night stand with this guy and he is still in the room. He hasn't left yet and so she's standing out on the, the balcony kind of waiting for him to leave and then all of these thoughts, like the whole book, are flooding her while she's standing there. How like one thought can spiral into other thoughts that spiral into other thoughts that have sort of um, an unpredictable ending to them. Like you just get led to a place that is so far from what was connecting to your first thought. Also, I feel like the weather um, had a whole role in this particular section. Um, it's really pouring down rain that she assumes is kind of uh, all flooding towards a river. Kind of mirrored like thought pattern and I'll read you why, why I thought that. Down with the rain to the sloping streets and further on to down the hills. Down to a river streaked with antique bridges and on from there down to the sea. Perhaps via many other countries, but this pan out of the journey is essentially the same. Trickling from a source to the rolling end, to far, far out and the no going back. So it makes me think of just these thoughts, like trickling from a source. You have a source of a thought and then it's trickling out and becomes a river and then it's just like flowing, flowing, flowing until it's somewhere um, far away. She's also exploring in this like just self-justifying um, when it comes to your thoughts. And then the section that I just read um, happens in a hotel room in Oslo uh, in Norway. I've actually been to Oslo. I think it's a really cool city. This time she's waking up in another person's room. It's not her hotel room. It is a hotel room just of a man. Waking up there and she's lingering. She's not leaving and so this section is basically her coming up with theories in her head why she's not leaving. And this story, like I don't want to give too much away um, because I think it would be interesting if you read it. Revealing like something that connects to a loss or a deep sadness of hers and this character starts to become much more layered to me and now a sense of loneliness and loss and that this man that she wakes up to is reminding her of someone and you know maybe that's the reason why she's not leaving this hotel room is because she's took taken into the past by looking at this stranger and i think that this character has a fear of the past that memory is sort of something painful for her, but at the same time it's comforting for her and she can't help but keep going back to it. And then the last note that I wrote um, is that each section starts a bit confusing to me and then eventually we reach something more clear in the end, which I wonder if it's on purpose. Um, there is something 
weirdly puzzling at the beginning of each section. So I wrote the confusion at the beginning of each section that slowly reveals something clear in the end. Is it possibly mirroring our thoughts? That sometimes our thoughts are really jumbled and associative in the beginning and then eventually in some cases, you can reach something clear. Similar to Ferrante, that she writes a woman's inner monologue, inner dialogue with herself even, and just the, the psyche so well. But, so this is, she's the only other writer that I've read that I can think of that writes the psyche this well, but just in a really different style, in a different way. Definitely have never read something like this. And she's doing something very creative with a form here. And very moving um, and touching. Like I'm, I, start a, I start a section kind of confused, trying to put pieces together. What is, what is this scenario? And then by the end, I'm really, really deeply touched. And that's all. I feel like this vlog is gonna be a lot of reading and cooking. You're gonna make a salad? Yeah, I'm making a salad. I'm also making hummus. And we have here lentils and rice, aka mijala. Paste. I got tomato juice all over the floor. I don't know, what would you call this? Lunch or early dinner? <laughs> yeah. It's like an isolation, like Dinner. all the, like everything in the hours get mixed up and eating is really weird. It's like isolation first organized meal. Yes, of the exactly. Day. We're gonna watch uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. I did a costume change for eating because I was afraid I was gonna spill a bunch of stuff on that um, beautiful dress. So you changed into an Isabel Morant. So I changed into Isabel Morant vintage. Drinking a really gorgeous wine that we had in Greece because we went to this um, wine tasting vineyard, yeah. I guess, uh, wine tasting, and the what grape winery. <laughs> the grape that they're famous for in Catalonia, the island that we were on, is called uh, Robola. 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 Rabola. Rabola. <laughs> uh, this winery had a few Rabolas wines. Right. And this one is called Rhombus. And we loved it so much that we bought one for your parents and one for yeah. us. So we are, we opened ours. Yeah. Mm, it's actually cheers. not a hundred percent Rabola. It's like also is it a mixed? little bit Sauvignon Blanc. Rhombus is crisp and fresh with aromas of citrus and peaches and mineral notes. It pairs perfectly with fish, seafood, and white cheeses. Which none of the above were having. Yeah. But it's delicious. So good. Look at the color. Cheers, baby. Cheers. I just really wanted to share with you our isolation soundtrack. We're making chai. You're making chai. I was just showing them our gorgeous soundtrack for isolation. Oh my god. Which actually now it's gone, but... But it was... We did something really naughty. We ordered donuts. Um, Two for tonight and two for tomorrow morning. The ones we're having tonight is literally called the Bridget Jones Donut. I don't know what's better. That's gonna be a pretty thing to show you once it arrives in five minutes. Ah. Food porn. It's two minutes. <gasps> Look at that. And we have our chai tea. Mm. Good night, everyone. Even is this position? It's like, like night, bro. Night, bro.
to you from the bathroom because Ahad is um, doing a yoga, a digital yoga. Also simultaneously, I'm gonna do um, some skincare because I just got out of the shower. I forgot my notes. I'm not prepared today. Oh, the things you do to give each other space in an apartment, you know what I mean? Sitting on the bathroom floor. So I've come to almost the end. I've just got one section left. The last section took place in a hotel room in Auckland in New Zealand. The beginning was funny. I was like, okay, I see you. He was throwing in some humor bits there that was enjoyable. In general, I start to love this book more and more as I read it. And I was just chatting with Jessica from Jessica's Bookstack on uh, Instagram. I'm sure you know her. If you don't, follow her. We actually live in the same city, so uh, hopefully we'll be doing like a coffee or wine session soon once we're both out of isolation. She read a book with an introduction by um, Emer McBride and she was telling me that she was like, first of all, her sentences are super complex, really, really sophisticated use of language. It was like so spot on. Her sentences are really, really complex. And in this one, it's like really sophisticated language and word choice, meeting and confused psyche so that can be like kind of difficult what i've been trying to say this whole video as we progress in the book it's getting just so much more poignant and beautiful and i feel i really care for this woman at this point and definitely this book is dealing with a character who's dealing with grief Sometimes when you lose something or lose someone, it can completely like rip you apart from the rest of the world. That's how it can feel. This character is in these hotel rooms because it's the only kind of refuge from being inside the outside world. This character sort of lost her place in the world um, and her relationship to the world. And just the hotel room is this kind of, I don't know, environment for her to just be in and be solitary and look out of the window and see the rest of the world from a distance because she feels a distance from it. Yeah, so this is really touching me. So I, I, I underlined um, a page or a passage that said she recovers herself. She's recovered from her existential overindulgence. So this is this character. She's like in an existential research in her head and at some points it can feel overindulgent. But I sort of can respect that it's like you're reading these character, this character's thoughts, but it's really her thoughts. It's not tailored for you. It's not even tailored really for the reader to feel like it's the right amount of indulgent, it's the right amount of perspective. Like, it is just this woman's thoughts, and sometimes they're overindulgent. So I start to really respect that um, perspective. I'm putting on some serum now. Very, very pleased with this book. I really want other people to read it so that we can talk about it. I feel like I haven't found someone, at least through social media or booktube, that has read it, so I don't have another person to really go back and forth on about this particular piece. You know, plans for the day are, what can you do? Reading and, you know, doing all those activities that feel like versions of the same thing to kill time. But I'm also enjoying the time, not enjoying that sound, just moisturizing. Bye! The biggest skincare tip for me is just massage that face. I don't care how you do it, just do it. Bring the blood flow, baby. I just finished this book. And the end was particularly strange in the sense that the last 40 pages, I really think I didn't understand anything. Which at first frustrated me because I was like, oh, but I feel like I was getting in the rhythm of this kind of strange, heady book. And then it kind of lost me in the last 40 pages, but it's, it lost my head, but it didn't lose my feeling. It didn't like lose my heart, if that makes sense. Like, I am totally confused 
Um, and I have a lot of pieces I feel like need to be puzzled together in my head, I, although I don't know if it's possible or I don't know if it's supposed to be understood. The whole book is from third person, like she, 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 she. Midway through the last section, it changes to I, first person, which we assume is the woman herself. But then I'm not sure if the she was, she talks about like, imagining a hotel room that she's in so i'm not sure if everything that we read is actual things that happened to this woman if she was ever in those hotel rooms or if she's imagined them or I, i'm not really sure um deeply deeply sad i don't know i don't know you guys i'm all kinds of jumbled up in my head now i can't say that i really understand the end of this book but I do feel like reading it feels like losing someone. Like I felt like I lost someone um, because she loses someone or leaves or something and I felt, I felt it even though I'm not sure I got it exactly in, in the details. Please, please somebody read this book so that we can talk about it and you can tell me what the hell you think happened in the last 40 pages. Anyway, I thought this vlog was going to be a whole week, but I've already edited most of the vlog and it's already 40 minutes. Um, it's just unusual for me that I basically finished two books in a period of three days. I'm just, I, yeah, I had a lot to say and a lot to talk to you about, so it's been a long one and I'm gonna cut it here. But I really did enjoy this. A lot but it has thrown me a curveball in the end that I don't even know what I'm thinking and feeling I think I might go watch an interview with her um, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one bye